Okay, good afternoon. So thank you to Anaridi Europe and to Neil for inviting me for, to speak today. Um, I've been given two talks in this session. The first one, I think you're going to know pretty much everything I'm going to say, and it shouldn't take too long. Um, my second talk is a bit more interesting, I think, especially for the audience based on the debates. But, but here we go. So... I'm going to just give you a general overview of the process of how we undertake the genetic management um, of our aniridia patients. Um, and I am a, an ophthalmologist, but I specialize in genetic eye disease. I see children and adults um, with uh, aniridia in my clinics. So my viewpoint is very much from the genetic aspect um, of how we deal with our patients. So you're all gonna know this. Um, and actually I was told by um, uh, James, who's from uh, Aniridia Network, why do all of you keep putting the same slides up at the start of your talks, but here we go anyway. So the prevalence of aniridia um, is around one per 40,000 to 100,000, according to the literature. And if we took all aniridia patients, two thirds would be aniridia, um, with PAC6 mutations, and a third generally um, are patients with Wagger syndrome. Um, and patients with Wagger have deletions that affect the PAC6 and WT1 neighboring gene. So with regard to aniridia, um, it was mentioned yesterday there is panocular features. So uh, patients can present with complete or partial iris hyperplasia, iris translucency, abnormal architecture, pupillary abnormalities. Um, they will present with early onset nystagmus, usually apparent from six weeks of age, reduced visual acuity from childhood. They will have foveal hyperplasia, a degree of this. So it's important that we undertake OCT imaging to look at the extent of which um, the fovea architecture has been affected. They can have optic nerve abnormalities, optic nerve hyperplasia, coloboma. Some patients can also present with microphthalmia, microcornea, ocular coloboma. So it's also very important that we undertake ultrasound to measure the axial length of these individuals and undertake a, a good fundal examination looking for any chorioretinal or optic disc colobomas. Patients then go on um, slightly later in life to develop cataracts, glaucoma, limbal stem cell deficiency with vascularization and a pacification of the cornea, aniridia related keratopathy. And so it's important for aniridia patients to have lifelong follow up under the glaucoma uh, and or cornea um, teams. And then there is this wealth of uh, systemic features that we don't tend to really mention much, but our aniridia patients suffer from um, weight problems, obesity, hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, diabetes, central auditory processing disorder, olfactory dysfunction, anosmia, midline brain anomalies, sleep disturbance, autism, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, and anxiety. So we mustn't forget these systemic features. And between 90 to 95% of our classic aniridia patients have heterozygous loss of function variants affecting the PAC6 gene locus. So it's important that we mention Wagger syndrome, Wilms tumor aniridia genital anomalies retardation syndrome. Much rarer, it affects one in 500,000. But when we are in clinic and we have an infant or child presenting with what may be sporadic aniridia, i.e. no family history of uh, traditionally isolated aniridia or aniridia caused by PAC6, then we need to initially always worry about Wagger syndrome. So Wagger, Wilms tumor is the most worrying feature known as uh, nephroblastoma. Child this is a renal malignancy affecting childhood. 90% of children with Wagger um, will develop a Wilms tumor by four years of age and 98% by seven years. They also have genitourinary abnormalities, end-stage renal disease, ureteric abnormalities, gonadoblastoma, 
They can suffer from intellectual disability, behavioral abnormalities as well, including depression, ADHD, OCD, autism, childhood onset obesity, and pancreatitis. Now, the question here is how much of this is actually now down to the PAC6 mutation? We know that the uh, WT1 mutation is definitely contributes to the Wilms tumor, but maybe there is some crossover effect. So who needs those abdominal ultrasounds? Well, if we detect um, a deletion that's involving PAC6 and WT1 and we confirm that Wagger syndrome, those children will need to have a renal ultrasound every three months and they should be referred to a pediatric oncologist for that. And we, at least in the UK, would refer children to clinical genetics to take over their systemic care. We, they would continue with the ophthalmology for their eye care. But children with um, aniridia should be assessed by a pediatrician. And even if they're found to have a PAC6 mutation alone, we need to consider as well, based on the talks that we heard from James yesterday, whether we should be undertaking an MRI, MRI brain early on in childhood, and they should be assessed for endocrine and behavioral assessments. Now, when an adult presents, and that's often the case, at least in my clinics as well, uh, with limbal epithelial stem cell deficiency, we need to consider there whether or not we need to also test for PAC6, but there are a range of other genes that can contribute to this. And so that's just something to bear in the back of your mind that patients can present with other genetic causes um, of uh, limbal epithelial stem cell deficiency. So the importance of genetic testing and molecular diagnosis, well, patients and families want to know the cause of their condition, despite there not being a treatment as such. For us, it guides prognosis, so we can then advise families whether or not they will have maybe a, a slightly more milder um, prognosis or a more severe one. Um, it can help us establish those genotype-phenotype correlations. For us clinicians, it will help us identify other disease associations. Now again, yesterday in the discussion, it was very poignant that although the majority of patients have PAC6 mutations, some patients may have some other genetic causes such as FOXE1, CYP1B1, we've just heard a possible MAF deletion. And so those genes will have different expression patterns in the body and give rise to different potential systemic implications. And we can assemble the correct multidisciplinary team at a very early stage in that patient's um, journey so that we can minimize any comorbidities Morbidities arising from those other system involvement. We can provide informed genetic counselling to those individuals and to the parents so we can explain how it was inherited, what the risk of having future children may be, the risk of that individual having more uh, children in the future. Um, we can provide family planning advice. We can now offer pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to families. This is a form of IVF where you uh, take um, an individual's eggs and sperm, fertilize it in a dish, take a, a cell from the early developing blastocyst, check if it's carrying the PAC6 mutation, and then only implant healthy embryos back into the womb. Therefore, you would therefore avoid passing it on to the future generation. And there is a also now non-invasive prenatal testing, which is where you have a natural conception and around eight weeks of uh, pregnancy, you can take a blood cell, a blood test, isolate fetal DNA um, from the blood sample and again check if it's carrying a mutation. The next reason for genetic testing is access to the appropriate management and treatments and access to research. So a lot of you are in the audience today because you know that you have aniridia, PAC6 mutations. You're here to learn about the research that may benefit you in the future and to be close to those clinicians and researchers working in your field. It also allows you to enter into research studies and help us, for example, with natural history studies, um, understanding your disease and the disease process in more detail. So how do we test for aniridia? Well, it may vary from country to country. This is more of a standard approach. It's also 
possibly the most time effective and cost effective approach. But if you have a child who is presenting with aniridia, the first step is to undertake an array comparative genome hybridization to look for any deletions in PAC6 and WT1 because your immediate concern is to rule out or rule in Wagger syndrome. And that on average takes one to two weeks to get that result. So a, a cheap, quick test to rule out Wagger syndrome. If it's negative, on the basis that 90 to 95% of aniridia patients have a PAC6 mutation, you could then just screen the PAC6 gene and maybe ELP4 to confirm whether or not it's PAC6 related aniridia. And sometimes that comes back negative, in which case then you could consider targeted gene panels, whole exome sequencing, but in the UK we will do whole genome sequencing. If a patient, if an adult patient presents and you know there's no history of, of Wilms tumor, then it's likely to be more sporadic aniridia. You can either start off with just screening PAC6 or go for a whole genome sequencing. So the benefits, well, we know whole genome sequencing increases the diagnostic yield for patients. By undertaking whole genome sequencing, it, it may allow us to identify genetic modifiers, which could explain why m some patients have more severe disease or milder disease than others. It allows us to predict and prevent um, associated disease. That's specifically with WAGA, but also PAC6. So we could say, well, a patient may have a higher risk of behavioral issues, obesity, so we can assemble that correct team. It helps us to improve our genotype-phenotype correlations and then provide more personalized medicine to those individuals. So again, if we consider all the uh, systemic issues that are associated with aniridia, it could be that we refer patients to a sleep clinic if they're, refer if they're reporting sleep disturbances or support for behavioral disorders or monitoring uh, endocrine changes so that we can prevent um, uh, fulminant diabetes occurring. So this was a study we published a few years ago where we looked at 86 patients with molecularly confirmed heterozygous mutations in PAC6. And uh, we created this um, figure at the end of the paper just to kind of guide a, a bit of information on if there was any genotype phenotype correlations. And we found that generally patients with missense mutations, and this is actually widely known and was established before this, have slightly more milder disease. And you can see from this image um, that actually, if we look down here at just iris phenotype, um, it has the lowest number of patients with complete iris hyperplasia. And actually a quarter of patients have a normal iris. And then this diagram here shows the onset, the, the mean onset of um, cataract and glaucoma in these patients with different mutation types. And it's really hard actually to put a finger on which ones are potentially more uh, deleterious or which ones are milder. And the caveat with missense mutations obviously is there are some missense mutations that can cause more severe disease. And I will um, show you an example of that um, in a moment. This was a really nice paper that was published by um, Nikki Hall and David Fitzpatrick um, uh, last year, and this basically looked at undertaking whole genome sequencing from a, a cohort of aniridia patients that had previously been screened for PAC6 mutations um, and had come back negative. So they undertook whole genome sequencing on 37 unsold families uh, with classic aniridia. Um, and they were able to solve 60% um, of that cohort. They found one missing coding variant that had just been generally missed from all the previous screens, four splice site variants in the five prime non-coding region, two deep intronic mutations, and then in 12 out of the 19 families, they actually found large structure and structural variants with um, five partial or whole gene deletions, three deletions encompassing the PAC6 cis regulatory elements, two balanced inversions, um, and two complex rearrangements of the PAC6 gene. And then three of those families had deletions encompassing the FOXC1 gene. 
So I just want to leave you with two case examples of where PAC6 can cause atypical phenotypes. So this was a 24-year-old Caucasian lady presented with early onset nystagmus, no systemic features, uh, no history of consanguinity, no other family history. Uh, she was found to be uh, short-sighted with a right exotropia. Her visions were in the right eye, one logmar and 0 0.7 logmar in the left eye, normal pressures, uh, foveal hyperplasia and a horizontal jerk nystagmus. We undertook um, screening of the PAC6 gene um, as part of a targeted gene panel and we found that the patient had a heterozygous missense mutation in PAC6. Uh, we segregated the parents and found that the father carried the mutation but was completely unaffected. So then we undertook further testing of different tissues of the father. So we took a sample of his nail, hair, urine, and what we found is that he presented with a mosaicism. So some of his cells had the PAC6 mutation around 33%, um, but 66% of his cells were normal. But it happened that his, obviously his, um, his sperm carried the PAC6 mutation, and therefore he had a 50% chance of passing it to future children, hence his daughter inherited the PAC6 mutation, and she has it completely. Um, so that's just important to know that um, even if you have healthy parents, um, it's still important to segregate, and there is a phenomenon called mosaicism where a parent can appear normal um, but have um, a, a dominant um, inheritance for their children. Then we've got um, a 35-year-old Caucasian lady who presented with left unilateral severe microphthalmia, right aniridia, uh, microcornea cataract, optic nerve and chororetinal coloboma, and nystagmus in that eye. Um, she also presented with obesity and diabetes. Again, no consanguinity, no other family history. Um, one logmar in the right eye. Um, and light perception in the left eye, which was the severe microphthalmic eye, um, and normal pressure. And when we undertook um, uh, whole genome sequencing in this patient, we identified a heterozygous missense mutation in the PAC6 gene um, the, in a specific area of the PAC6 gene, which disrupts the SOX2 binding domain. Um, we did further studies where we grew up optic vesicles from this patient, and we actually found uh, that PAC6 could not bind correctly to the SOX2 protein and therefore led to a disruption of several transcription factors and producing more of a SOX2 phenotype with the microphthalmic phenotype. And this is the caveat to missense mutations. If you have a specific missense mutation in a particular binding area um, of the PAC6 gene, you can end up with much more severe uh, phenotype than other missense mutations in PAC6. So I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to a website called Gene Vision that we created. Um, but there are pages on Aniridia for patients and for professionals. Um, it's just a nice reference guide. Actually, it's an A to Z to genetic eye disorders. You can type in pretty much any eye gene, any eye genetic disorder. And there, it's fully accessible. Um, it's really good if you've got fellows in clinic that are new and want to kind of just look up the key things. But for patients, it tells you about the latest research and support organizations that you can reach out to. So just to conclude, genetic testing will help you reach a diagnosis. It is paramount in this day and age. We can't really get away with not doing genetic testing on our patients. It will guide the management and family planning. It will allow us to get the right multidisciplinary team assembled early for patients. Um, and again, for fellows or anyone in the audience who's interested in just understanding a bit more about how we do genetic testing and um, for inherited eye diseases, this is a, a really useful paper to read. And with that, thank you.